Welcome everybody. My name is Anna Gebhardt and I am field director for Let's Grow Kids. And Let's Grow Kids and the Vermont Early Childhood Advocacy Alliance are so excited to welcome you to this webinar titled Vote Smart, Make Early Childhood Issues a Priority This Election. Um, it's going, this informational section of this webinar will be led by myself and then Drake Turner, also a Let's Grow Kids employee, and Charlie Glisserman from the Vermont Early Childhood Advocacy Alliance. And then we also have a few other of our staff here joining the webinar to lead some breakout groups so that we will have time for discussion and for practicing so that you really feel like you can leave this webinar um, ready to engage candidates in uh, early childhood issues. So we have Amy Russo Perler from the Alliance leading a breakout and Emily Wagner from Let's Grow Kids, as well as Stephanie Makovich from Let's Grow Kids. And like I mentioned, Shayla Zamuto, who will be running our PowerPoint and also helping to uh, lead a breakout group. So Shayla, let's look at the next slide. Thank you. Here's our agenda for today, and I want to start by just making sure everyone knows that this webinar is recorded. So we will have this available for other people who are not attend, able to attend in real time to watch this after the fact. If anyone is uncomfortable um, you know, being recorded, there, there probably will be one of the breakout groups that will be part of the recording, and we'll make sure you're not in that breakout group. So go ahead, um, and you can either do a chat in the full group or you can chat Charlie um, privately to let her know that you prefer not to be in the breakout group that's recorded. Um, let's see. Also, we did have some um, candidates slash legislators register for this. So is there anybody here who is identifying as a candidate or currently a legislator? We'd love to know that you're here with us. So you can just go ahead and um, put in the chat who you are and what seat you're running for. So for our agenda today, we have this welcome and overview, and then we're gonna go over the election timeline, how to submit your mail-in ballot, gauging with candidates, why and how. And then we will, like I said, have some time to break out into small groups to practice and share, and then wrap up with some next steps um, and, um, and hopefully take some time for some questions. We've got a lot of information to cover, so I think we wanna just jump right ahead. As Charlie mentioned, we are hoping you guys could introduce yourselves. Oh, first, before I get there. Go ahead, Shayla, you're on the right side. Please submit any questions into the chat box. So the chat can be found at the bottom of your screen and this next piece and introductions will, will happen in the chat. But if you're calling in from your cell phone or you do not have that video sharing capacity, you can also text Charlie any questions that you might have. Um, so I'm gonna read her phone number out loud for any of you who may not be able to see the slides. Charlie's cell phone number is 802-595-9500. And we want to make sure everyone can participate. So if you do have any questions that you'd like to ask in real time, please text those to Charlie or, like I said, add them to the chat. So we're going to practice a little chatting. Shayla, next slide. And please, if you haven't yet, introduce yourself in the, in the chat box with your name, your pronouns, the town where you live in vote, and any issues you might be interested in speaking with a candidate about. So if you've already put your name in the chat, you can just add um, any of your interested subjects that you might be, you might want to connect with candidates about. And we will, um, that'll be a running theme through all of this, really thinking about the issues and the questions that uh, you want to focus on when you have a candidate in front of you. All right.
I see there's already some people adding to the chat that they already have their absentee mail-in ballot ready to go. And we'll be talking more about that. And we do have Jana Brown here from Richmond, who is running for the Chittenden um, House seat, Chittenden One in Richmond. Um, so I want to be clear before we get started that this is this webinar is intended for advocates to practice how to speak with candidates um, in order to have the most information and to be able to make their vote based on their values. So this is a nonpartisan opportunity. Um, we're going to be really focusing on early childhood issues. Um, and then the intention of this is not to have uh, back and forth actually with any candidates. Um, but there will be more information about how to attend local forums where you will have those opportunities. All right, so let's get started. Um, Charlie, will you go ahead, Shayla, you are heading in the right direction. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, as Anna said, my name is Charlie. Uh, I use she, her, they, them pronouns, and I'm the Public Engagement Director with the Vermont Early Childhood Advocacy Alliance. So quickly for folks who don't know, um, the Alliance is a coalition of early childhood stakeholders from parents to businesses and early educators who are advocating together for policies and investments to benefit the lives of young children and families. And so I'm so excited to speak with you all today about a topic that's really closely connected to that. Um, which is voter and candidate engagement. So if you look at this Vermont voters timeline 2020, you will see that we have a primary election coming up on August 11th. Um, that is about, it's two weeks from today. So it is coming up quickly. And we wanna make sure that all of you have the information that you need um, to vote in that election safely. Um, so this primary election will be um, where folks will determine the political party nominees that will be on the ballot in the general election in November. Um, and I know that Drake and I were chatting before this and making sure that all of these details that might be a little different this time, what date do I have to mail my ballot by, can I vote in person, how does that all work? And I'll definitely go into the details in the upcoming slides, but overall, um, how you vote and when you have to turn your ballot in is dependent on where you live. But the best practice is if you're going to mail in your ballot to do it ASAP and at the latest one week before the election. Don't worry if you haven't requested your ballot yet. Um, I'll cover that in the next slides and explain how you can still vote. Another reason why this is just a really strange time um, is that we're seeing the impact of COVID-19 on the legislature schedule. Um, so usually they meet January through May and then they are done. But with the shift to virtual meeting, they've extended the legislative session through June and then we'll also be meeting again starting in late August um, to finish crafting the state budget. So usually legislators aren't campaigning while they're legislating, um, but this year many will be. And so early childhood issues, including early education and childcare will really be hot topics. And it'll be interesting and different um, to uh, advocate in this environment. But we really are counting on you all to make sure that children and families are a priority in both of these areas this summer and fall. Um, so Shayla, if you could just go to the next slide, please. So before I jump in um, to the nitty gritty details of voting, which, um, you know, might be a little surprising to some folks, but I think it's a blast to talk about um, these fun process details. If you could just complete the poll that I launched um, to see if you've requested your mail-in ballot for this election and if you've submitted it already. Um, just so I have an idea of where you all are at in the process and can tailor the next part of the presentation to meet your needs. So that is awesome. We have a lot of ballot requesters in the room. Um, there are over 100,000 ballot requesters in the state of Vermont so far. Um, and so that's really exciting. Um, and we just need to make sure that everyone has the tools that they need um, to complete and return those ballots. Okay. So it looks like most folks have requested it, um, but haven't submitted it yet. So I'll make sure that I cover 
all the details of how to submit your ballot. Um, so Shayla, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thanks so much. So there are three basic steps to voting by mail. Um, you can request your ballot, complete your ballot, and submit your ballot. It's easy as that. Um, and if you haven't requested your ballot yet, the best way to do it is to call your town clerk and figure out a plan that works for both of you, whether that's picking it up um, from your town clerk's office and filling it out at home and dropping it back off at the town clerk's office or exchanging the ballot completely by mail. Your town clerk is also your one-stop shop for information on voting, and they can answer any questions you have and also connect you or folks that you work with with supports for voting, like translated sample ballots. Um, one of the most important things that you need to remember when you're submitting a ballot by mail um, is that it does need to be submitted in time to be counted. So it either needs to reach your town clerk's office the day before the election or your polling location the day of. So those ballot requesters who haven't submitted it yet, just make sure that you keep those deadlines in mind and submit them as soon as possible to make sure that no mailing hiccups will prevent you from casting a ballot in this August primary. It's also important to note um, that you can still vote in person. The Secretary of State's office is working very hard to make sure that people can vote in person safely. They are providing masks for folks who don't have them, hand sanitizer for polling workers, and actually working even with the Department of Health to, to um, map out how all the tables and poll workers will be sitting to make sure that people can socially distance in the polls. So early voting and voting in person um, on August 11th will be available to you if that's the only way that's accessible for you to vote. Um, and next slide, please, Shayla. So here are just a couple quick tips on vote by mail to make sure that you can get that ballot in and not have it spoiled. Um, a spoiled ballot is when there's an error on the ballot. Um, either you've um, not signed a certificate envelope that you're supposed to sign or you didn't put a ballot in the correct envelope and you need to follow these directions very carefully um, to make sure that those little process issues don't prevent you from getting your ballot submitted. So when you get your ballot by mail, you will receive instructions with your ballot. It's called the certificate envelope and has this step-by-step -step, um, on what to sign, how to complete your ballot, what to do. Um, so just follow those carefully and you should be in a good spot. One important thing for the primary election is that in the primary election, you will be given at least three ballots. So you'll be given a ballot to fill out if you're a Democrat, a Republican, or a progressive. So you need to make sure that you look at the top of that ballot and make sure that you're filling out the, the um, ballot that is associated with the political party you want to be voting with and only complete that one ballot. If you complete the multiple ballots, none of them will be counted. And lastly, if you have any other questions, um, the Alliance worked with our partners to put together a step-by-step -step voter guide that lays out all of this information. Um, and we'll send that link to you and follow up and it'll be um, on this webinar at the last slide. Um, but you can also visit mvp.vermont.gov or call your town clerk. Any of these sources are great ways to get information on how to vote and vote safely. Shayla, next slide. And I think that's all for me for now. And I will hand it over to Drake, who will talk a little bit about engaging with candidates on early childhood issues this summer and fall. Thanks, Charlie. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. All right, so we um, are really excited to talk to you about this important issue today. This is clearly a really unprecedented time to be, um, to be a voter and to be thinking about who you want to represent you in the state house. Um, even amidst all the stuff that's happening at the federal level, it's more important than ever um, that we have a, a legislature and that we have folks representing us who represent the things that we care about in Vermont. Um, so that's what we wanna talk about now. Um, but before I jump into my portion of these slides, I, I wanna know and we wanted to know um, what are folks' experiences with engaging with candidates? I know that there are definitely some seasoned advocates um, on this call. So if everyone wants to just take a couple of minutes or a few seconds to enter in the chat, 
um, at your response to this question, which is, have you ever asked a candidate a question about childcare or any other issue you care about? Um, and maybe just a sentence or two about how it went. Um, and then we will move on to a couple of tips and suggestions that we have for how, to, how easy it is to engage candidates and why it's important. And once we get one response, we can move on to the next slide. <laughs> Right, so Leslie said that she's emailed with candidates about childcare um, and that some folks respond and some don't. That's definitely true. And I think in this virtual election season, I think a lot of folks are, um, you know, having to adjust to emails and phone calls and texting. So sometimes they're not as responsive as we would hope. Um, Stephanie has talked to candidates before and felt nervous, but it worked out great. I think that's a pretty common experience that folks have had. Um, Anna. That's a great point that candidates like to hear personal stories. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Allison has attended coffee hour meeting times. You know, some of the things that have, have been great ways to engage with candidates in the past aren't necessarily available to us right now, uh, but that's a great point. Lots of awesome responses. Thank you all. All right, so I have a few slides to share and then we're gonna break into small groups to talk a little bit more in depth about how to do this. Um, but I wanna just share a few things about why we think it's so important to engage with candidates um, on childcare and just about issues that you care about. You know, I think that, that this primary season is often like really overwhelming to see how many names are on your ballot. I know that when I first got mine in the mail, it was a bit of a shock to see how many names are on there. Um, so engaging with candidates allows you to do a lot of things. Um, it helps you make sure your vote represents your values and that your representation in the state house is reflective of things that you care about. That's really important. Um, and engaging with candidates is, is the best way to find that out. Um, but it also helps you educate candidates on the, the issues that matter the most to you. Um, you know, folks wanna know what their constituents care about so that they can go represent those values and those issues in the state house um, and in whatever elected office they're campaigning for. So in, it's sort of a two-way street, right? You're, it helps you make an informed choice, but you're also, helping to, to educate your candidate, and especially, you know, in a time like right now where so many things seem so important. Um, you know, I think candidates are really counting on, on voters and on their potential constituents to help them do that work. Um, and the third really big reason it's important to engage candidates on childcare is that when you talk to candidates about childcare and about early care and education, you're making this a campaign issue um, across the state. You know, the, the, the more we talk to folks about the things that matter to us, um, the more we're building a movement, the, the more effective we are um, as advocates and the better, you know, over the long term, um, this system gets when we continue to elevate the, the crucial need for investment in the early care and education system. Um, so it helps build awareness for the movement as well. So we can move to the next slide. Thank you, Shayla. Um, so to kind of break it down into the two big things, I think a lot of people are wondering now, um, the two questions that we want to answer are who's running in my district um, and where do they stand on investing in childcare and on this, this crucial system. So we want to break that down a little bit as well. We can move on to the next slide. Um, so the, you know, really the, the best way to find out who, and a lot of folks probably know, it sounds like from the poll, a lot of folks already have their ballot. Um, so if you do have your ballot, then you have all the candidates listed there. If you're interested in, in learning everyone who's, who's running or if you haven't gotten your ballot yet, you can use the Secretary of State website or go to the My Voter page, which is mvp.vermont.gov to find that information. Um, and then once you know who's running, often that's not really that helpful because it's a huge list of people and how do you know who, what the right person is for you. Um, so then the second step comes in, which is you know, thinking about what really matters to you, and I would venture a guess that probably most of you care about childcare, which is why you're on this webinar, um, but I'm sure that's not the only thing that matters. So thinking about what are the questions you want to have answered, what are the issues that really matter to you, how are you going to best make that decision about who you want to vote for, um, and then the second step is to define that information. So there are a lot of different ways to do that. I just want to briefly list a few here um, and also um, kind of tease that there will be more coming from us. 
Um, Google is often a really great resource, especially this election season. A lot of candidates have websites and a web presence because they can't just go from door to door knocking and, and talking to people in person. Um, and I I live in Burlington and I've noticed that the folks running in my district have, I think there are only like one or two candidates who don't have a website that has very clearly laid out their stances on a lot of issues. Um, so that's a really great resource, but often that doesn't include everything. And I definitely have seen, you know, there are a number of, of candidates who have opinions on issues that they haven't necessarily listed on their websites. Um, so the third thing that we recommend you do is just check your mail. A lot of folks are mailing stuff right now as well. Um, and to seek information from other sources, such as the Early Childhood Advocacy Alliance or Let's Grow Kids or other organizations that you care about um, who are doing their best to, to give information um, that's going to help support folks' choices. Um, we have at Let's Grow Kids have just uh, published our voter resources page on our website this week. Shayla's going to show it at the end of, of the webinar. Um, it includes some resources now. We last week did a child care forum for statewide candidates where we invited all of the candidates for governor and lieutenant governor and the folks who participated asked, we asked them a number of questions. It was really helpful to see where folks stand. Um, we also have, what else do we have right now? We have an issue brief that we've created that talks about what our vision is for um, a high quality and affordable childcare system. Um, and we're also working on creating a lot more resources. So some things that will be available soon, um, and we hope you'll check back to our website for our um, a voter toolkit. There's the Alliances How to Vote toolkit, which is super helpful. Um, we're also planning on doing a, a candidate dashboard where folks can reach out to their candidates much more easily for the general election, um, as well as candidate statements on childcare. So there's a lot that's coming up. There's a lot that exists. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the information that you need or if it's enough or there might be a question that you want to ask that hasn't been asked yet. Um, and that's why really the best way to engage with a candidate is to talk to them um, and ask them yourself, which means that could be they're giving you a call and you answer the phone, they're texting you and you respond to the text or you initiate the outreach. Um, and, and then the last step is to, to share that information with others. Um, so it's pretty simple. Um, it can feel really awkward the first time you do it um, or before you do it the first time and then it it ends up being really helpful and you're also as I mentioned helping the candidate um, so it's just a great experience all around uh, we can go to the next slide all right so I talked a lot <laughs> but assuming you get a candidate on the phone then what do you do what do you say what do you ask them how do you have this conversation um, before I give a few tips that we've identified I want to show an example um, with folks information um, blurred out about how it looks for a real life example in Vermont. So we can go to the next slide here. So this is a text exchange between um, a candidate and a potential constituent where you can see on the left, they asked, you know, will you join our movement? You know, listed a number of, of issues that the candidate stands for. Childcare is not one of them that's, that's here. And then the person that was contacted just asked, what's your stand on early childhood education? Put some information about things that they see um, needing work and support, um, and, and even a mention of the necessity to support early childhood educators. Um, and then the candidate, this is from a volunteer from a campaign, which is often what the text, where texts will come from. Um, but then that volunteer is able to communicate that with the candidate um, and they've gotten more information about why it matters and why childcare needs to be supported by all candidates. Um, so it can be really low stakes in terms of just responding to a text, um, but that helps you to learn a little bit about what that candidate stands for. And it also helps the candidate um, get that feedback from their potential constituents. Um, so before we go to breakouts, I wanna just give a couple of tips on the next slide. Great, so in terms of, of thinking about once someone gives you a call, and sometimes it can be at a time that you're maybe not prepared to talk to someone, but that's the way it usually happens in, in these situations. Um, the, really, the, it's sort of a two-part process. You know, ask a question and tell your story. So we've listed three questions here that we think might be good starting points for folks who aren't necessarily sure how they wanna phrase this or that cover a lot of the issues that we see um, candidates wanting to engage with. Um, and these are also taken from the, the questions that we asked the lieutenant governor and gubernatorial candidates during our forums, which are posted, the videos from those forums are posted on our website. 
Um, so there's a question about, you know, what's your vision for Vermont's childcare system? How will you ensure early childhood educators are fairly compensated and supported? And how will you support funding for Vermont's childcare system? You obviously can ask whatever you would like, um, but these are three good questions to get a conversation started um, and to learn more about what a candidate feels about uh, Vermont's childcare system. Um, and often some of the answers might not be as in depth as you would like, or you wanna have a further conversation, that's when it's a really great opportunity to tell your story, to really illustrate why it is you care about this and why candidates should care um, about investing in Vermont's early care and education system. Um, and often, as Anna mentioned in the, in the chat earlier, um, candidates really like to hear stories. People in general like to hear stories. It helps to illustrate why concepts and facts and data matter to people because it really brings them to life. Um, so if you feel comfortable sharing your personal story related to childcare um, and how the system has affected you, that can be a really effective strategy in talking to candidates. Um, and just remember, one last reminder is that this is an opportunity to engage with candidates about why childcare is really critical to the health of Vermont's families and our economy, and you're helping candidates see why this is such an important issue um, and one that they need to champion if they're elected. So you're doing uh, something that's going to help you make an informed choice, but you're also helping um, other Vermonters. So it's a really important thing to do. All right, so we can move. Oh, on. yeah. Should we should we do a little practicing? Um, this is one of my favorite things to do. I think several people on this call have been in trainings with me before where I say, let's role play. Um, it can be awkward and a little intimidating, but this is the safe place to practice. This is where we get to work out the kinks, fumble with our words, give it a try, kind of feel into what feels right for us so that by the time you do get a text from a candidate, you are prepared with what you want to say or when, you, when you're on that phone call, um, you know, it can, it can roll smoothly because you've already had the time to practice. Um, and remembering that, you know, as we're practicing, remembering that this is just the first step in building a lasting relationship with this candidate who could potentially be representing you in Montpelier um, in January. So, um, we are, I don't know a lot of details about this process, but I think it's pretty simple. We're just going to break into small groups and give it a try. <laughs> okay, folks, cross your fingers. All right, I'm going to click join. So exciting. I know, right? The anticipation. I know. <laughs> Are folks having, I, I know, so Leslie, Stephanie, and Shayla will be, actually, I, I, I can't take both Shayla and Stephanie's time. I'm going to put one of you in another group. Sounds so, good. Stephanie, you're going to breakout room one. One. Joy. <laughs> Okay, and um, so I don't know if um, Sandra and Allison, if you're having difficulty joining your breakout groups, um, but you're of course welcome to hang out with Shayla and I, of course. Okay. So, um, if we could just do some brief introductions, I don't know if um, Sandra had to step away, um, but just because, you know, before role playing you, you've got to get to know each other a little bit. <laughs> um, so as I said, my name is Charlie. I am the public engagement director at the Early Childhood Advocacy Alliance. Um, and Shayla? Yep, I'm a regional field manager with Let's Grow Kids, and I have, I'm living the childcare years <laughs> right now. I have a 21 month old and a three and a half year old. Oh, wow. I thought you only had a three and a half year old, so. No, double trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we, can, we can skip Sandra for now. Sure. Um, I'm Leela Nordman, and 
um, been working in a number of different museums. So at the Fairbanks, we had a um, preschool, the Bulch Preschool, and then now I'm at the Old Stone House, and they're looking at doing a lot of preschool programming and sort of ag, 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 ag uh, <laughs> trying to, um, anyway, they're finding out who needs what sort of in the area in Orleans County, because it's, um, uh, Caledonia County seems to even have more resources than Orleans County when it comes to early childhood. So we're trying to reach out and create some curriculum if we can. So this for me is really just like a learning opportunity because I've never reached out to anyone to advocate. <laughs> so <laughs> this is just, yeah, it was also just a chance because I did, you know, I got all my um, ballots and everything just to also figure out, yeah, <laughs> ready to mail, um, yeah. to figure out like, you know, who to vote for and who really will either advocate or has policies surrounding early childhood care. So um, I think that's obviously on me to do some of that research, but I just thought this was a way of sort of learning a little bit more about it. But it also sounds like how to engage with um, someone, uh, you know, a, a candidate along those lines, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for sharing that. I So as someone who's volunteered on a lot of campaigns, um, it's kind of how I got my start in advocacy on, on that side. The, the first thing to know is that candidates and campaign volunteers want so badly to speak with you, particularly during this time where it's so difficult to actually reach voters and have a conversation about what they care about. And so I think this role playing will, will be really helpful for all of us because this is exactly what we need to be doing. We need to call um, all of our candidates and say, what 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 are your perspectives on X issue, whether it's child care, or early childhood investments, um, or clean water, um, and make sure that we are making really informed choices about who we're voting for, and that we have their ear because that's going to be so important um, if they end up being elected because they'll be making these huge decisions that impact our lives so much. Um, so with that spiel, I don't know um, if Shayla, do you want to do some role playing? Absolutely. I am a huge fan of role playing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> As an extrovert, it's one of my favorite things. <laughs> yeah, role, role playing is, is, is fun. It's like, um, it's like middle school drama camp. Yes. <laughs> um, well, so I'll, I'll let you take the, the reins for a couple minutes and then, and then I can take a turn. Sure. Um, Let's see, Leela, do you have a preference? Would you like to be a concerned constituent or would you like to be a legislator? <laughs> oh my gosh, I, uh, I guess a, concer a concerned st constituent, I'll try okay. that out. Great, that's perfect because I am a really easy legislator. <laughs> Great, so um, I will just share a little bit about my first experience um, before I started with Let's Grow Kids. Um, and as I started my homework from my boss at that time, he said to me, have you ever reached out to your legislators? And I said, nope, I don't even know who they are. And so my homework was to go home and do that. And I grew up in New York where you don't just reach out to your legislators. And so I was terrified to do it. I was like very uncomfortable. I thought I was stepping way out of my zone. Um, and I was living in Burlington. And at the time my legislators were Chris Pearson and Keisha Ram. And I, dialed before I could make myself knock. And the one thing I had just come from working with animals and animal advocacy. And so I basically said to both of them, you know, in a, in a very soft pitch manner, you know, like, what do you, what do you, do you like animals? You know, like, what do you think about it? humane societies and animal rights advocacy? Um, and I was terrified, but I had two of the best conversations that I've had to this day with a legislator. Um, and my takeaway from it was that they, they both thanked me profusely for calling. They thanked me for sharing what was important to me. Um, and now when I see either of them, I like, I just go back to that, that first exciting thing. And it was so funny because I hung up the phone. I went over to my then fiance and I was like, you're never going to believe what I did. And I was <laughs> like, you know, I was so proud of myself. Um, so it's very exciting for me to be doing this with you because it really is um, an empowering thing. 
So with that said, um, I'm going to pretend to call you after you have emailed me to ask me a question. Okay. <laughs> um, and I will just say, hi, Leela, this is Representative Zamudo, and I'm just returning your call. Hi, Representative Zamudo. This is, or uh, Zamudo, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> this is Leela, and I was just following up because um, I'm, you know, curious about uh, STEM education at the pre-K level and what kind of support there is for it, because I know that there's sort of universal pre-K, but are we supporting STEM at the same time? Or is that something that you're uh, interested in or have any background in um, and can share any information that you might be, um, that, or knowledge that you have? Sure. Well, I will be one of the first people to tell you that I don't know much about it, but I am a parent of two young kids. And I know that when they are in childcare, STEM activities are some of the most important activities for me and my family as our children grow and learn. And I will say that I rely on my child care provider uh, for that because she's got the degree and she understands it. But I would love to hear your take and sort of borrow from your experience on it to help better educate me in the nuances of things that I'm not very well educated about. I think like some of the issues are just uh, having funding for materials and also for education for, you know, um, professional development for the um, instructor because, you know, they may not have a deep background in that. They may have a literacy background or something else. But so I think it's, you know, looking at professional development and then, yeah, where, where the access to materials are. Because I feel like STEM can be sort of tool and heavy or something along those lines. So thinking about like, are there uh, pockets of money <laughs> for such yeah. a <laughs> Yeah, so what I'm hearing is that by and large, it's a funding stream issue and wherever the legislature could identify money to help with this uh, would be beneficial to, to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and taking off my role play hat, I don't exactly know the answer to that, but. <laughs> I will flub it for this conversation and say that I will take this information with me back to the state house and talk to my colleagues in committee because they, you know, they're our best um, resource for finding pockets of money for things just like this. Oh, great. That's great to know because we're looking, looking forward to that as <laughs> something to help us move forward with, uh, you know, teacher trainings and just materials for, for uh, early education. That are Fantastic. Needed. And then another question I would have for you is that in the future, if I need to talk about this or I need some clarification, can I reach back out to you and have you sort of help school me and educate me on this? Oh, sure. That would be great. I'd be happy to be a part of the conversation moving forward. Fantastic. Great. <laughs> no, that, you, you both did such a great job. <laughs> um, Absolutely, Shayla. Follow, follow up and f potential follow up is so key because you never know. They might email you a year and a half later and be like, yeah. someone brought this up in the hallway of the state house. And I remember I had such a great conversation with either this constituent or percent potential constituent. And like, I need to reach back out to them and like hear their story, even if they don't do it at that moment. So Yep. Great suggestion. Um, and as sort of like a backup statement for that, so I am in touch with many volunteers through Let's Grow Kids, and I get emails from our volunteers regularly throughout the session that says just that. You know, like I emailed Representative Mary Beth Redmond in Essex, and she got back to me and she wants to know my point of view about Act 166. What should I do? And then we have this great conversation, and it it just spurns these really great relationships that you know, are based on facts and trust and actually help move early childhood funding forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I don't know, so it looks like we have about three minutes left. Do, do we want to try and do another role play? <laughs> I'm not sure if I'd be so good in the legislative <laughs> position, but... <laughs> Uh, I can I can be the legislator um, if, if you'd like. I think the important thing is just to get in the habit of asking those questions and reaching out, and making sure you feel comfortable doing that. Um, so I can I'm going to be a senator. I'm going to be Senator Glisserman. <laughs> I um, love it. And 
uh, do you want to reach out to me by phone? Give me, give me a cold call. <laughs> sure. Um, so hi, um, my name is Leela and I'm just curious if you have a little time to talk on the subject of clean water. Mm. Leela, <laughs> I have all the time in the world to talk about clean water. Um, <laughs> Is there a particular um, aspect of this equation that you're interested in? You think regulation um, can change, more money? I think it well, help you? Let's see, I, maybe it's, um, maybe do, uh, thinking about like, you know, watersheds in certain places. And so, you know, along the Connecticut River Valley, we've got a lot of uh, watersheds on this side of the state, you know, we might not be represented as much as maybe say over towards Burlington or watersheds like in Stowe, that area. So um, maybe thinking about like what kind of resources for um, protecting those watersheds or um, are, you know, who might be buying up land to conserve it. Um, so thinking about are there any groups that I should be looking out for? Or is there any money that goes towards conserving um, through the state mm -hmm. um, for those uh, areas of watershed? Wow. No, I, I really appreciate hearing people's perspectives on this because, you know, water impacts our lives in so many different ways, whether it's, um, you know, making sure we have clean drinking water or that we can go take a dip in, in Lake Champlain. Um, and I, just taking off my role play hat, I, I wish I knew more about clean water to engage in this conversation with you, but putting it back on, um, this is not a, an issue that, that I know nearly enough about. And so, um, I really appreciate you bringing this up and this means that I need to do some research and look into what the, uh, my legislative colleagues are considering on this issue um, and get back to you because I want to make sure that you have all the information um, that you need to be effective community advocate. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And on these really hot days, especially muggy days, it's great to have a clean space to go take a dip in and feel <laughs> confident that you're going to come out and not have E. coli <laughs> or anything like that. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I I went swimming um, two two days ago and was like, hold on my nose. Yeah, um, don't swallow. Don't swallow. Okay, so that was wonderful. You did a great job. I, Shayla, do you have any specific feedback? No, I think that's great. And the other thought that's running through my head is that I think depending on the representative, especially, or senator, especially if they're incoming in there new, they probably aren't going to be very well schooled on a lot of the issues you're gonna be talking about. Mm -hmm. um, they really do, because our legislature don't have staff, they really rely on their constituency to help educate them on things that matter. So with some of the ones that are there now, they're very well versed on many, many issues, and I think a lot of the incoming ones will get there, but it will take a lot of um, interaction and engagement just like this. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, so I just uh, gave people the one minute warning in their breakout rooms. So folks will be joining our conversation shortly. Um, but do you have any kind of closing thoughts or questions or anything? I mean, it's definitely helpful to sort of practice and realize that in some ways you may have more information than they do, but it's really a sharing out and getting that information to the people who can make a bigger impact, you know, than, than you might be able to. So that's very helpful. Absolutely. You know, um, at the very least, you are an expert in your own experience right. and um, off and see, know more about watersheds than I do. And so um, I appreciate you kind of educating me on that. Hi, everybody. We're back. Hi. How was the role playing? Awesome. Get some good practice. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Some great I'm, connections and conversations. I'm going to jump back into sharing screen and then put myself on mute. All right. We're going to get our, our slideshow back. I'd love to hear uh, a little report from a breakout room or two if someone wants to kind of share what they talked about or 
um, maybe reflect on what they learned. Yeah, that would be great. Shayla, will you go to the next slide so I can minimize it? And, you know, I'm going to, on my screen, just slide us over because this slide doesn't have any text on it. Now I see everybody's faces. So go ahead and take yourself on off of mute and let us know any takeaways from, from practicing. I can jump right in and say that I always find it refreshing to feel like a legislator when I role play because it lets me know how much I don't know, which I think is also very true for legislators sometimes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and a big part of that is it, it shows how much power you have to share your experience and your expertise with legislators, and that helps them make better decisions. And so not only are you engaging in, in advocacy, you're also helping legislators out when, when you reach out to them and share your perspective. Anybody else wanna share what it felt like to ask the questions? Um, do people feel prepared for if they're contacted? Uh Go ahead, Marta. I, I've been practicing um, all along because I've actually been doing it. I'm fed up. I, you know, I've been in daycare for 16 years, and um, it, the daycare system is really sad right now, and I really think that we should have a serious voice. I've been running a home daycare for 16 years, and it originally started because of my children. I have a, one in high school and one in the middle school now, and I'm still doing it. And, you know, I heard the conference today and there, you know, he, he makes me mad. Smith makes me mad. You know, he, you know, at the beginning is like the promise has all these things and they gave us a parameter. It's also harder, I think, for our in-home take care. So I spoke to um, Ali, who lives in the neighborhood. He's a state representative. I, uh, uh, I spoke to Bob Harp. I have spoken, I actually called Senator Bernie's office and spoke to an advocate, they called me back. Um, I learned a lot that the, the Senate, what the senators actually do, you know, she told me I mean, what their jobs are, you know, what they go and advocate for us and allocate for money for us to bring into the state and then they distribute here and she was surprised how there isn't anything for us in-home daycare providers set up so that if we, or, you know, get sick and you have to close, you know, she was just kind of, so that's something she took down. I called Senator Leahy's office also, you know, <laughs> left my message, um, just because I really think that this should be, uh, educators should be under the same umbrella. I really think, you know, when it comes to sick pay, vacations, you know, we don't, we don't have, we are, I think, in the earlier stages, I think, we're the ones who are molding, molding and shaping the children to send them off to them, you know, and, um, you know, we're in the front line right now. Like right now I'm working right now. I got one in the living room. I just show Emily my daycare over there, the other one sleeping. And, you know, they don't have masks. You know, they're three years old. They're not wearing masks. This one, you know, I got some autistic children here. He, they come with a mask and they walk around like what I'm doing right now, you know, with it and they're not, or, so we, I really think that we didn't get, I just have so much to say, sorry. Yes, you do have a lot to say, Marta. I'm sorry. so glad that you're speaking up and, and talking with the candidates and um, voting based on this passion that I feel from you. You know, we have to remember that we do have the opportunity to uh, you know, elect people to represent us who really understand the necessity for investing in the work that you do. So great job. Great, great job. Thank you. Does anyone else want to share anything about speaking up, talking with candidates? Oh, I could just share a really quick thought, um, which is I think, um, I think people definitely shouldn't hesitate to approach their local candidates regardless of their political party, because I don't think I've ever seen um, necessarily seen a legislator or a candidate who is going to be against supporting children and families. So I feel like it's an issue that 
you know, most people can really get behind. I mean, whether or not you can push them to make it one of their top priorities is a different question. But I think, um, I think nearly everyone is going to be really receptive to hearing what folks have to say. Um, yeah, I agree. Thank you. Can I um, say one more thing? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Actually, on my policy that I rewrote, I actually encourage the parents to please call their state representative. I swear because we think that they should help them with payments. If they, you know, to call them, to make a voice, to let them know the more parents that call, the more they know that this is an issue. So I swear I, I changed it because I felt really bad having to be out for a week to get tested for COVID because of my job and not ask, you know, to get paid. I felt bad asking, you know, the parents to get paid right now. I'm working with trying to figure out the state you know, how are they going to pay me for subsidies? But not everybody's on subsidy. So I really yeah. think that, you know. The parent voice is so important, Marta. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I think, you know, as... Um, professionals in the early childhood field and I uh, looking around I think most people here work in some kind of field whether they run a child care program um, themselves or work for an organization that supports early childhood across the state and one of the most important things we can do is to do that Marta to organize to get the families that we serve involved to make sure that their voices are heard um, and legislators are overwhelmingly ask us asking us to hear from parents and I think that at this point candidates really need to hear from parents um, parents with young children who are struggling to get to work to find the care they need to afford um, everything that it takes to raise a family um, in 2020 uh, and what a strange year it is. So, you know, this is going to be so important and we need to remember that, um, and I was in a breakout group with Morgan and we were talking a lot about how this is a strange year. While we have people out campaigning, we also still need to complete our, um, our state budget for next year, which it was the legislator's job to f finish in the winter, which has not been completed yet. So they're going to be reconvening on August 25th, and Charlie showed you that timeline. So we're going to need to be advocating and having parents reaching out and making sure that um, the issues we care about are included in the budget for next year, while we're also at the same time talking with candidates, while we're also at the same time talking to our federal delegation like Mark did they have an opportunity right now um, to negotiate increased investments in childcare and and so there'll also be a call to action this week about that so there's a lot of moving pieces and the more we can organize and the more we can get more people involved um, the the better our chances of being heard and of seeing the investments that we're asking for um, so speaking of next steps Sheila would you advance us to the next slide so what's next? <laughs> the most important thing right now is vote. So request your ballot today. Um, you need to have requested your ballot at least one week before voting and the primary elections are on August 11th. So make sure you've requested your ballot and when it comes in, fill it out and get it back um, as soon as you can. And um, what was also mentioned today is that Let's Grow Kids CEO, Allie Richards, interviewed, uh, well, we invited all the candidates and she interviewed those who showed up um, for Lieutenant Governor and for the Governor. Um, so we have a gu gubernatorial forum that's been recorded and is available on our website. Um, and so you should watch that and you should send that to the parents that you serve and you should send that to your friends and family. Um, there's a very easy survey right after that you can take um, and I'll, I can put a link to that in the chat right now where it has the video embedded at the top, a few questions to answer. And then once you do that and you click submit, it'll give you the opportunity to share it on Facebook. And that is a great way to click that Facebook share if, if social media is your thing and where you have people who are looking to you for advice on their next steps. And then you can share the video with them. And just like that, we've informed a lot of people. Um, so, Oh, you have to submit. Charlie's making a clar clarification. So you have to actually request it now so that you can send it at least one week before the actual elections. So that's really important to keep in mind. Um, Stephanie, it looks like Stephanie just put the link to 
the video and the survey that I mentioned into the chat just now. That's that um, the link that has the secureeveryaction.com URL. And we have a question from em Emily Wagner. Do you, if you request an absentee ballot for the primary, do you need to request one for the general also? Charlie? That is a great question. So the Vermont legislature really stepped up um, and made it so that for the general election, every active voter in the state of Vermont will get a ballot sent to their mailbox. So you do have to request a ballot for the primary election on August 11th, but for the general, it will just appear like magic. Um, I know it's very exciting and Vermont is one of few states in the nation that have really taken that step and committed to access to democracy that way. Um, and we will be releasing an updated voter guide in advance of the general election to make sure that all of those process questions are answered and they have all the information to vote in the general as well. Exactly, Emily. Yay, Vermont. Well, great. And we are at two o'clock and I'm sure people have other Zoom meetings to head off to. Um, we didn't have a ton of time for questions, but I hope you were able to ask some in your small groups. And if you have any additional questions, you can feel free to email um, me, Anna at letsgrowkids.org or Charlie, who I'm sure you've received a confirmation email for this. Um, and also your Let's Grow Kids field managers are always here to support you. So you can join, uh, look on our website and you can reach out to us. We're here to support you one-on-one -on -one with anything you need for candidate outreach and beyond. So thank you so much, everybody.